Hello folks and thanks for joining me for part 3 of the history of the Dionysian artificers and we're right here where we left off you thought I was going to make you wait <laughs> so that was a good uh, thing there and I wasn't expecting these you know notes and footnotes and all that to be in this format I, you know so we just we're going with it and uh, we'll try to finish this up in part three here. So Plato mentions that this uh, Zoroaster, 12 days after his death, when already placed on the pile, on the pile, you know, the, the flame pile, came again to life, which perhaps represented, if not something more abstruse, the resurrection of those who are received in heaven going through the twelve signs of the zodiac and he says likewise that they told they hold the soul to descend through the same signs when the generation takes place um, now this is to be taken in no other way than the twelve labors of hercules by which when done the soul is liberated from all the pains of this world of the material world clemens strong's and uh, let's see now uh, Macopulus Macopulus in Hesiod um, book one of Kudworth uh, this and I quote this God whether he ought to be called that which is above mind and understanding or the idea of all things or the one since unity seems to be the oldest of all things or else as Plato was wont to call him want to call him the god i say this uniform cause of all things which is the origin of all beauty and perfection unity and power produced from himself a certain intelligible son every way like himself of which the sensible son is but an image julian's oratory and praise of the son we see the unity of God as the sun from a distance obscurely. If you go nearer, more obscure still, and lastly, it prevents seeing anything else. Truly, it is an incomprehensible light, inaccessible, and profoundly it is compared to the sun, to which the more you look, the more blind you become. End quote. Damascus, Platonius, uh, Platonius, 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 I was hoping my tongue would work. Uh, Deunitate and uh, the remains of the sectarians of Zoroaster, also called are called now in Persia the Gubers, Gubres. Uh, not sure if that's pronounced right, but the who and who led a miserable life, and the more persecuted by the Mohammedans or the Mohammedans Islam than the Jews are in Europe by the Christians still perform their devotions and say their prayers towards the sun or fire but assert that they do not adore them only conceive them symbols of the deity uh, now let's see this is Bid Stanley D D Bit Pissar um, quote again the first God before the being and only is the father of the first God who he generated preserving his solitarity or solitary unity and this is above the understanding and that prototype which is said his own father his son one father and truly good God this is the beginning God of God's unity from one above essence the principle of essence essence comes from him for this reason is called father of essence this is the being the principle of intelligence these are principles and most ancient of all this intelligence acting or operating which is the truth of the Lord and the science in as much as it proceeds in generating bringing to light the occult power of the concealed reasons is called in the Egyptian language a mom but inasmuch as it acts without fallacy and likewise artificially with truth is called Ta. The Greeks call it Vulcan, considering the acting or operating inasmuch as he is the operator of all good is called Osiris. 
who, in consequence of his superiority, has many other denominations, in consequence of the many powers and different actions which he exercises. And that's Jambalicus, uh, Demeister, and Egypt. Um, and the Hebrews call it, you know, that word right there, Shem Hamphoresh. Um, in the sacred rites, popular purifications are in the first place brought forth, and after those, as are more arcane. But in the third place, collections of various things into one are received, after which follows inspection. The ethical and political virtues, therefore, are analogous to the apparent or popular purifications, but such of the cathartic virtues as banish all external impressions correspond to the more occult purifications. The theoretical energies about intelligibles are analogous to the collections, but the contraction of these energies into an indivisible nature corresponds to initiation, and the simple self-inspection of simple forms is analogous to epoptic vision. That's from, uh, oh, in, I'm not going to pronounce that, but it's in Pla uh, Plato's Fade. And uh, the interpretation of the symbolic kind is useful in many respects, for it leads to theology, to piety, or piety, and to show the ingenuity of the mind and the consciousness of expression, and serves to demonstrate science. For before the delivery of these mysteries, some expiations ought to be take place that those who were to be initiated should leave impious opinions and be converted to the true tradition. Alexander gained from him Aristotle, meaning from him Aristotle, not only moral and political knowledge, but was also instructed in those mere secret and profound or profound branches of science, which they call epoptic and ecro Acroamatic, and which they did not communicate to every common scholar. For when Alexander was in Asia and received information that Aristotle had published some books in which those points were discussed, he wrote to him a letter in behalf of philosophy in which he blamed the course he had taken, and the following is a copy of it. And Alexander to Aristotle, Prosperity. You did wrong in publishing the aromatic parts of the science. In what shall we differ from others, if that sublime knowledge, or sublimer knowledge, which we gain from you, be made common to all the world? For my part, I had rather excel the bulk of mankind in the superior parts of learning than in the extent of power and dominion. Farewell. So he was, you know, mad because he shared the secrets with other people. And you know, these people are, you know, throughout time, they're greedy. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many wars have been fought over just information. He is called Dionysius, or Dionysius, and because he is carried with a circular motion through the immensely extended heavens, orphan. And uh, indeed there are, as the saying is, many who go into the mysteries, a multitude certainly of branch bearers, but very few Bacchians, Socrates and Plato. A woman asked how many days ought to pass after she had congress with her husband before she could attend the mysteries of Ceres. The answer was, with your husband immediately, with a strange man, never. That's from Clemens Strong's, from Strong's. And uh, as a proof of the sublime ideas of God entertained by the Egyptian sages, in contradiction to these gross accusations, we copy the following passages from the very Mercurius Trimagestus as related to or by Pamandrus. Now, the artificial, misquoting, the artificial fabricated the whole universe with his word, 
not his hands. He, however, has it always present in his mind, acting all, one only God, constituting everything with his will. This is his body, not tangible, not visible, nor similar to any other, for he is not fire, nor water, nor air, not even spirit, but from him depend everything good, however such he is, as everything belongs to him. Again, but that you should not want the principal name of God, nor you should be ignorant of what is clear, and seems concealed from many, for if it never appears, it is nowhere. Whatever appears only to your sight is created. What is concealed is all eternal, nor is it a reason why it should appear. As it never ends, he puts everything before our eyes, but he remains concealed because he enjoys an all eternal life. Clearly he brings everything to light, but he delights in the addendum, addendum one, the oneness, the uh, un and uncreated, incomprehensible to our imagination, fantasia, but as everything is enlightened by him, he shines in all and through all things, and yet appears chiefly to those to whom he is pleased to communicate his name. Again, there is nothing in nature that is not him. He is all that exists. He is even what is not, and what is he brought into light. And as nothing can be made without a maker, so you must think that unless God is always acting, it is impossible for anything to exist in heaven, air, earth, sea, and all the world, in any particle of the world, in what is as well as in what is not. This is, with the best name, God. This, again, is the most powerful of all things, this conspicuous in mind, this present with eyes, this incorporeal, this, as it were, multicorporeal. For nothing is in the bodies that is not in him, because he alone exists in all. He has all names, because he is the only Father. So it has no name, because he is the Father of all. And that's from a good Kirker, volume 2, page 504. And uh, this is exactly what Jesus was talking about. Uh, people are very confused. But the actual Father is just the Father. He has no name. He is a God of no name. He is that he is, period and all. All these other names are false gods and, and no uh, uh, name that you can come up with uh, because there's no men, man that knows the name of the Father other than knowing him by the name of Father as Jesus called him. Jesus did not call him Jehovah, uh, freaking Abba, Laba, Baboomba or any other damn name. Um, uh, Yahweh, um, 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 Allah, or, I mean, go, go down to this. I don't care which one of them, because the Father does not have a name. So, Synesius, speaking of the Egyptian Hierophant, observes thus, they have, and, uh, uh which are arcs concealing, they say, the spheres. Now, see Plutar, the aside, uh, the end of the Syaride, and, uh, oh, and let's see, so, all right, sorry for that brief interruption. Julius Africanus, a Christian priest, by birth a Jew, made a short compendium of the history of Manithon, and that the author himself might be dispensed with. Now this was about the year 230 of the Christian era, and 230, and uh, finding that the Egyptian chronology represented the world some 
thousands of years older than the chronology of the Bible, he so disfigured the days of Menthon as to make him agree with the Bible. Moreover, this work of Africanus is also lost, and we have only extracts of it preserved in the work of a monk generally known by the name of Sincilius, who confesses that he mutilated and altered Africanus. Now this individual not even had the original Bible, but only the Greek translation, which avowedly has the chronology vitiated, and yet Manthon's data were to be dis disfigured and interpolated uh, uh, to make it square with the incorrect Greek translation of the Bible. Okay, so Celsus seems to me here to do just as if a man traveling into Egypt where the wise men of the Egyptians, according to their country learning, philosophize much about those things that are accounted by them divine, whilst the Eots or idiots, in the meantime, hearing only certain fables, which they know not the meaning of, are very much pleased therewith. Celsus, say, I say, does as if such a sojourner in Egypt, who had conversed only with those idiots, and not been at all instructed by any of the priests, in their arcane and recondite mysteries, should boast that he knew all that belonged to the Egyptian theology. Um, now, when amongst the Egyptians there is a king chosen out of the military order, be is Fort Wright brought to the priests, and by them instructed in the arcane theology, which conceals mysterious truths under obscure fables and allegories. We will content ourselves here with the authority of Kircher, one of the most learned antiquarians on Egyptian matters. Um, okay, quote, Therefore Hermes, that great author of the hieroglyphic doctrine, elucidating many things chiefly about God and his perfections, also of the creation of the world and its preservation, of the administration of the same world and its parts, both by himself and through his angels, as he heard of the patriarchs about the government of the world, endeavored seriously to penetrate these things. Hence sprang a new philosophy in which, as he treated of more sublime things than the ignorant could understand, he veiled under a new art, afterwards called hieroglyphic, which was hidden from rude understandings, not in wooden monuments, but in mystic figures engraved in hard stone for an eternal memorial with posterity as a sublime science of things deserving eternal veneration and worthy of being recommended to all and in an imitation of the great eternal artificer in the administration of the world. He so constituted his system that it was communicated only to the select heromists, priests, stolists, and hierogrammatists, and men of great genius, wise for the government of the state, according to the rules of administration, prescribed in the obelisks, men who had shown ability and aptitude, and were moreover restricted by oath to keep it secret. By these means, the priests, being looked upon by all with admiration in consequence of their science in those new things, expressed in the symbols, were honored by the multitude almost as half-gods. But to increase this veneration, they told the people many things about the apparitions of the gods, their answers, and how they were to be worshipped to soothe them and make them prop propitious. Now, to this we must add the great profit they had by their machines and mechanical inventions and their skill in mathematics, and their making statues that moved their eyes and head to express approbation or disapprobation, and that the miserable multitude was deceived and beguiled, paying always to obtain a favor from the gods, or to avert their anger, when hence it came, that in the course of time that religion conceived by Trimestus 
in a sincere sense, was by degrees generated into open and declared idolatry. Kircher, Volume 4, page 82. So, O Egypt, Egypt of thy religion, only the fables remain, and those incredible to thy posterity, Trimodestus in Asclepio, and the immigration of the Ionians to Asia Minor is mentioned by Herodotus and others, but the epoch is fixed by various authors differently. And uh, by it, there's examples by Playfair in the year B.C. 10, uh, 1044, the Gillies by 1055, and Bartholomew and Anacharsis in uh, 1076. It is said that the chief of the Ionian colony was Androculus, and uh, a legitimate son of Codrus, the king of Athens. So it is related that the Ionians established their royalty, and those descending from that race even now are called kings and enjoy their boners, boners, that is to say, a place where they attend the spectacles and public games, wearing the royal purple and a staff instead of a scepter, and the Illusionian rites, Strabo. Now, uh, this immigration is also mentioned by Herodotus in uh, that all that this uh, following literature. Uh, Plutarchus in Homero and uh, Velius Perculus in Chronico, uh, and from Clemens in the Library of Strong, and um, Vid Strabo above. Now, Byblos was the capital of Sinera, and there was a temple of Apollo, situated on an elevated spot not far from the sea. Afterwards is the river called Adonis. Now, Libidios, or Libidios was the seat and assembly of the Dionysian, Dionysian artificers who inhabited from Ionia to the Hellespont, where they had annually their solemn meetings and festivities in honor of Bacchus, and their first seat was Theo. The Latin translator of Strabo renders the Dionysian, Dionysian artificers um, because Bacchus or Dionysus was uh, supposed to be the inventor of theaters and Asina, uh, derived from the Hebrew word to inhabit. Now, that would be to inhabit your mind. Um, <laughs> uh, so, okay, we go on. Uh, from the application of the instruments of the architecture to morality, the Platonic and Pythagorean philosophers took not only types but words to explain our moral ideas. For instance, a right man, rectus, or a rectus, obligation from ligament or ligamer, or ligar, uh, or ligar, and uh, from the same law, it was also ligament or uh, ligar, lex ligar, to square our actions is from quarter, quarter, and uh, or to quarter, and justum aquium or aquum aquum, a rude mind, polished mind, from rude stone and polished stone. So the difference between you know like a, a crude mind to a polished and, and educated mind, whatever, whatever, what have you, you know, sophisticated man. And so the meetings or assemblies of the Dionysian artificers went by various names, and uh, which was the place of their meeting is a contubernium, contubernium, and uh, which was the place of their meeting. The society was called sometimes. Uh, I, of course, I can't pronounce the Hebrew or whatever this other writing. Um, collegium, but we know that one. Collegium is the Greek, like colleges, collegium. The collegia uh, and the communities, community, communities, uh, community college or collegiate. Um, so anyway, um, you know it all fits in. It's all together. They, they pull these names from the antiquities, and so this example imitated those Ionians who immigrated from Europe to the maritime countries of Caria, Asia Minor, 
and also the Dorians, their neighbors, building temples at a common expense. The Ionians built the temple of Diana at Ephesus, and the Dorians that of Apollo at Tripoli, or, or Tripi, Tripi. <laughs> And where at a certain period they repaired with their wives and children, retired with their wives and children, and were performed their sacred rites and had a market, and likewise games, racing, wrestling, music, parties of different kinds, um, and made common offerings to the gods when they had performed the spectacles and the business of the market or fair, and fulfilled towards each other the duties of the fellow creatures. If there was any litigation between the cities, they sat as judges to settle the dispute. Moreover, in these assemblies, they debated as to the war with the barbarians. The crude minds, you know, not the sophisticated. The barbarians, right? And the means of keeping a mutual concord amongst the nations. Just trying to give you some context. I mean, you can think, you got to think back in context for the times, you know what I mean? And it, especially in the, when it comes up in the earlier reading in part two, we read about uh, the Dark Ages, basically, with the loss and the destruction of the barbarians, these crude mind people, you know, came and destroyed all of this knowledge from the uh, Library of Alexander, you know, on with other examples. So after this, the inhabitants of Ionia thought proper to apply Cambyses, Cambyses, and having represented to him what was their business, the king ordered them into his presence, and asked who they were, and how they came to live in his dominions, and having examined and ascertained from whence they proceeded, he admired them and chose rather that they should be erected into a society by himself than to allow that he received such as coming from another country, for he thought it was not decorous to receive favors from others, so or who sojourn in his country, as if he would receive those services as pay for their inhabitations, and therefore to show this, dismissed them with presents as marks of his munificence. Robertson's Greece and Kings chapters, uh, these are the references in the different footnotes, you know. So this, uh, this one here is an English translation of the Bible in the Kings, where the original Hebrew says Giblim, uh, Hebrew Giblim, or the Giblites, uh, which means inhabitants of Gebel, renders it by the appellative stone squares. The proof that his, this reading is not correct is not only because of the different opinions of all other translations which understood by this Giblum, the inhabitants of Gebel, but that the same English translation in another part of the Bible renders the same word by the ancients of Gebel. Now the Gabel or Gebel was the same as Biblos is clear. Um, because of the subsequent version always translates this Gebel for Biblos. And though there were several cities of this name, yet this one seems to be that which is between Tripoli and Berite, or Berit, and is still called Gebel, or Jebel. And uh, now Jebel, Jebel was the same, oh, whoops, sorry. In fact, sorry, it somehow skipped. Okay, in, in fact, Lucian in his treatise D. D. Syria says expressly that Gabala was Biblos and famous for the worship of Adonis. Now, uh, for we find in Ezekiel these words, and I quote, And I saw the women sitting weeping for Thamuz, that is to say, Adonis. Such, however, was what was done by the inhabitants of those cities, in testimony of which they sent letters to women who were at Bab Biblos, Babylos. And uh, when Adonis was found, and afterwards scaled the throne into the sea, and they say they were spontaneously carried to Biblos, and when arrived there, women ceased to weep for Adonis. Thamuz signifies the name of a month, and likewise the name of an idol or divinity, which even in the opinion of St. Jerome is the same as Adonis, 
Plutarch says that the Egyptians called Osiris Amuns, and from thence was corruptly derived the name of Jupiter Amun. And uh, Robertson, the Thesaurus Linguae Sancti, says that the word Amuns, read Amun or Amelm, is used by Herodotus and Plutarch, and were corruptions from the Hebrew Thamuz and uh, TMWZ, TMZ, TM, get it? Yeah. <laughs> you think you think I'm joking? You think there's no connection to that? Serious. Anyway, I would rather say that the word. Think about it. Think about Harvey Levin. Anyway, I would I would rather say that the word was originally Egyptian and made T Hebrew by the addition of the formative Hebrew and uh, for the more so as Amuz in the Egyptian language signifies by the explanation of Manetho in Plutarch, uh, sometimes abstruse or concealed, which has an evident allusion to the concealment or symbolical death of Osiris or Adonis. Now thus in the numbers uh, 3, 5, 7, 12, and 15 must have been persevered or preserved as essential in the ceremonies the symbol of death and resurrection the crossing of the equinoxial twice and in the time and the season of the year when the sun arrives at the two tropics the rising and the southing and the setting and uh, then that's Crohn's uh, Chronicles chapters and Sino page in Greek Petra uh, justly, therefore, Plato, knowing the world to be a temple of God, showing a place in the city where the symbols should answer, Clemens, we shall, and that was from Clemens, we shall here first quote the authority of the Jews on this point. Now let us consider what may be subjugated, sub-indicated by the cherubim and the flaming sword turning every way. What if this ought to be thought, this circum circumvolution, of the whole heavens, right? The cherubim and the flaming sword turning every way. What if this is thought to be the circumvolution of the whole heavens? But of the flaming sword turning every way, it may thus be understood to signify the perpetual motion of these cherubim and of the whole heavens. But what if it be taken otherwise, so that the two cherubim signify both hemispheres? Now, if you've ever seen a time-lapse picture of both hemispheres and the circular motion of the stars in the sky. Okay, so the tunic of the high priest, uh, since it was of linen, represents the earth, but the blue, the pole of heaven, the lightnings were indicated by the pomegranates and the thunders by the sound of the bells. But the two sardonyxes with which the pontifical garment is clasped don't denotes the sun and the moon but if anyone wished to refer the twelve stones to the twelve months or to the same number of stars constellations in the circle the zodiac which the greeks called the zodiac he will not wander from the true meaning okay the pontifical garment is clasped denotes the sun and the moon just like if you've noticed, uh, you know, the the fish hat, the uh, pine cone on the staff, uh, that everything that dude wears and everything about the Catholic Church is all symbolism. Completely and surroundedly. There's a whole nother language going on there. Sorry, I had to drink some water and my throat was getting really dry. <clears throat> Alright, so... Um, you know, now for the Christian fathers, it would be too long to follow the prophetical and legal statements which have been expressed by enigmas. Almost the whole of the divine scripture offer up these sorts of oracles. He who responds or reasons properly will find sufficient for the purpose. We, we shall give a few examples. So, for instance, 
what the ancients told of the temple, the seven enclosures, which also referred to other things in the history of the Hebrews, and what was inside by the apparatus of the diverse symbols, referring to appearances, signify in their composition what refers to heaven and earth. They signified then what to the nature of the elements imports the revelation of God. For the purple comes from the water, the linen, Greek busos, from the earth, the blue from hyacinthus, and from the color of the sky, as it is dark, the scarlet, the fire, and in the middle, however, of the temple was the veil, beyond which only the priests could go. There was the censer, the symbol of the earth, which is this world, and from which exaltations take place. But that place, which afterwards inside of the veil, where only the high priest had permission to enter, and that on certain days the external court, which was open to all Hebrews, they say was the medium between heaven and earth. Others say it was the symbol of the world, which is perceived by our intellectual senses. But the opening which separated the infidelity of the people was extended before five columns and separated those who were in the court. Now, uh, Clement Strong, this Christian father, explains these columns by the following passage of Plato. Plato says we must contemplate these columns and diligently see that no profane person dares go there. Those are, pro those are profane who believe that nothing exists but what they can touch with their hands, but the actions and generations and all those things which we cannot see and things which exist are without number. Such are those who attend to nothing else beyond the five senses. So that is your definition of a profane person, okay, a secularist, an atheist, um, etc. These people are profane. Um, that is a clear definition, you know. Some people just think profane means you know ignorant or or whatever, you know. That's in their own ignorance. Um, there's specifics. So anyway, Clement Strom's, uh, now for the candlestick, which was placed on the south of the censer. By this was exemplified the motion of the seven planets, which had their motions in the south. For on each side of the candlestick were branches, and in them lamps, because the sun also, as a lamp, is placed in the middle of the other errant stars, on those which are above it, and those which are below it by a certain divine harmony, receive light from him. Him meaning the sun. That's where all light comes from, is the sun. And, by the way, there is only seven planets, and there's still only seven planets. They can say there's nine, they can say there's eight, they can pop it up to eleven and bring in planet X and any other thing they want to make up. But there's only, there's only the music of the spheres, the original spears and, and um, the Bible tells you the history of this and what they are and there's you know I'm not going to get into all that here um, those things however told of the sacred art signify the world as perceived by the intellectual senses which are occult and shut to the vulgar beside now the vulgar or the ignorant the vulgar or the the ones that a lot of people mistake as profane. Okay, there's there's actually a difference. So besides those golden images, which having six wings, they either signify the two bears, as some will have it, or what seems more convenient, the two hemispheres. Indeed, the name of the cherubim signifies an extensive knowledge, but both have two wings and thus signify the sensible world and the time carried on by the circle of the zodiac. That's Clemens. And but the three sixty bells pending from the long robe of the priest are the times of the year, for it is said this is the year of the Lord, preaching and sounding the great arrival of the Saviour. Now the two brilliant emerald stones which are on the shoulder piece signify the sun and the moon, which are the helpers of nature, for it was supposed the shoulder to be the beginning of the hand and but those other twelve stones which are disposed 
in four rows describe to us the circle of the zodiac and agreeing to the four seasons of the year. The first civil month of the Jews called Tishri, the Hebrew Tishri, was from the Egyptian misery or misery and changing only the formative into the Hebrew. And the word was derived from the Hebrew Emer, or YMR, as then the sun was in the equinoxal, and the rabbins to this day call the equinoxal Mishri, or Mishri. And the Greeks, spelling badly, the name called this Egyptian month, um, I can't pronounce that, <laughs> um, Humusrul something like that. So the number 12, which is that of the months of the year and alluded to in so many types of the temple, must have afforded also faculties or facilities to establish the system of the Dionysian artificers, and therefore we shall give some idea of the heathen philosophy attached to this number in the following extracts from Suidas. Now the great Demergios, or architect of the universe, again, not God, I mean, not the Father, sorry, that, that is, the Dermergios is the God, what, what you, what some people would name Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever, whatever. Um, the architect, but that's not the Father, and it's not the same Father that Jesus was talking about. Jesus is not referring to the, the, the Demurge. So anyway, all right, the great Demiurge, or architect of the universe, employed 12,000 years in the work he has produced and divided in 12 times the 12 houses of the sun. Now, Swedus Arcteria. In the first thousand, he made the heaven and earth. In the second thousand, the firmament expansion, which he called Coleum, Coleum, and a coil. <laughs> in the third thousand he made the sea and in the water that runs on the earth in the fourth he made the two great torches of nature and in the fifth that's the sun and the moon and in the fifth he made the quantipeds animals that live on the earth and in the waters in the sixth he made the man in the first six thousand years having preceded the formation of the human race it seemed it will not exist but during six thousand years which are the others to complete the period of the twelve thousand at the end of which the world will finish. Okay, so is the idea. Okay. And now if you take each sign of the zodiac, I mean, so that are, for the people who talk about, oh, well, we can prove it's, you know, the earth's older than 6,000 years. You know, well, the Bible isn't time. There's a lot of stuff that happened before the Bible came along. See, even in the Bible's own history. The Bible, never mind. Uh, that's another subject, another topic for probably another channel. Maybe my Gnostic uh, Christ channel, perhaps, you know, if I get around to making videos for that. But now, if you take each sign of the zodiac for 24,000 years, you will explain the above mystery. When the sun comes out of Aries, or the spring sign, the world is said to be born. Here, the period of life begins, where the sun is in the cancer, or the summer, is in the pleasure and delights of life, when in Libra, life has declined, after that all is winter of death, and from this arise the fables about the four ages of the world. Okay, and of course you all heard the four ages of the world, the fifth age, all that. The books of Persia and mythology explain to us the same meaning. Time is 12,000 years, and it is said in the law that the celestial people were 3,000 years to exist, and then the enemy, Satan, or Ahriman, was not in the world, which makes 6,000 years, and a thousand of good appeared in the lamb, the bull, the taurus, the cancer, the lion, and the sheep, which made 6,000 years after the thousand of God comes the scale, or the libra, the Ariman came into the world, that is to say, the winter, death. Um, okay, Osmud, speaking in the law, says, I made the productions of the world in 365 days. It is for this reason that the six Gahamabar's months, in other words, are included in the year.
Astronomically speaking, there is no period or cycle of 12,000 years, but the Dupuis has solved the mystery by saying that the periods of the ancient Indians and Chaldeans answered to the series of 1, 2, 3, 4, or 4, 3, 2, 1. Thus, the duration of the four ages of the world, according to the Isor Vidan, were the first age 4,000 years, the second age 3,000 years, the third age 2,000 years, and the fourth age 1,000 years. Memoirs L and this, you know. Okay, so the Bhaga Vedan counts thus first age 4,800 years, and the second age 3,600 years, third age 2,400 years, and the fourth age 1,200 years to equal the 12,000. The Indians figured this system by a cow with four legs, or the number 12 taken successively, successively four times. Another Indian period establishes the duration of the world as thus. First age, 1,728,000, or 1,007,000, wow, okay, 1,728,000 years. Second age is 1,296,000 years. And then the third age being 864,000 years. And the fourth age being 432,000 years. And that would be a total of 432,000. That's 4,320,000 no, 4, years. Now the smallest of these numbers, 4,320, elevated to 234, will give us some total of 4,320. And uh, the Indians say the year of the gods is composed of 360 years of those of men. If you divide 4,320,000 for 360, you will have 12. In the Chaldean period, as given by Barosis, we find the same numbers of 432,000 and compose it as he follows the arithmetic order thus. First degree. <laughs> 12,000, second degree, 24,000, third degree, 36,000, fourth degree, 48,000, and fifth degree is 60,000. Sixth degree, 72,000, seventh degree, 84,000, eighth degree, 96,000, and 432,000 as a total. So the columns are familiar, uh, the pillars were denominated Y, K, Y, Z in Hebrew, Hebrew. The first signifies establish from, to establish or make firm. The second signifies in strength from the proposition and in the root strength. Now the Assyrians were the first among the children of Israel that sought peace of them. Macab, I should translate this passage differently thus. And those who amongst the sons of Israel were called the Sidians were the first of this assembly, and they wished to ask them and pe ask them peace. According to this interpretation, by far more expressive of the text, it is seen that the Assyrians were a respectable body, for they were the first of that assembly. Now, Cobb, this uh, it is said that then came there unto him the company of the Assyrians, who were mighty men of Israel, even all such as they were voluntarily devoted unto the law. <clears throat> the very word Assyrian or Cassidian is supposed to be derived from the Hebrew Cassidian. Or Kassidim, which is in Psalm 78, verse 2, and is taken in the sense of the men pious or pious, holy, full of piety and piety, or and mercy. So for thousands of centuries, incredible to be said, this people is eternal without anybody being born again amongst them. Um, okay. Before they admit anyone who desire it into their sect, they put him to one year's probation and inure him to the practice of their most uneasy exercises. After this term, they admit him into the common refectory and uh, the place where they bathe, but not into the interior of the house, until after another trial of two years. Then they are allowed to make a kind of profession, wherein they engage by horrible oaths to observe the laws of piety, justice, and modesty, fidelity to God, and their prince, never to discover the secrets of their sect to stranger, or discover, never to reveal the secrets of their sect to strangers, or to preserve the books of their masters, and the names of the angels with great care, Josephus, Loco, Citato. 
And uh, they hold the souls to be mortal. Then believe that the souls descend from the highest air into the bodies animated by them, whether they are drawn by some natural attraction which they cannot resist. And after death they swiftly return to the place from which they came, as if freed from a long and melancholy act captivity in respect to the state of the soul after death they have almost the same sentiments as the heathen who place the souls of good men in the Elysian fields and those of the wicked in Tartarus again like I said earlier it's you know Elysian fields is the top of the scale the high frequency the good vibes the positive side and Tartarus or hell same difference would be the lower side the the bottom frequencies the hate the anger the negative emotions the negative energies they create such things it's all about energy folks <clears throat> so some employ themselves in husbandry and others in trade manufacturers of such things only as are useful in time of peace their designs being beneficial only to themselves and other men you do not find an artificer among them who would make an arrow, a dart, or a sword, or helmet, or cuirass, or a shield, or any sort of arms, machines, or warlike instruments. Artificers don't make war instruments. If they do, they're not an artificer. Their instruction runs principally on holiness, equity, justice, economy, policy, the distinction between real good and real evil, and what is indifferent, what we ought to pursue or avoid, and the three fundamental maxims of their morality are the love of God, of virtue, and of your neighbor, which is your one commandment. That is the only commandment under the New Testament, which is the New Testament. It's a new with Jesus, and he left his disciples with one commandment. Love thy neighbor. If you love thy neighbor as you love thyself, or your brother, your, your brothers and sisters. There is no sin, there is no harm, there is no violation of rights, there is no anything, because love does not violate. All right, all right, enough with the spiritual lessons here. I'll try to finish this here, we're almost done. The Essenians transmitted the doctrines they received from their ancestors. Philo, the Vita Contemplativia, Contemplativia. Now, they had distinguishing signs, and I shall say something of their congregations, how often they celebrated their banquets, etc. Um, another time. <laughs> That's the end of the book, folks. And I thank you for joining me for this one. And uh, this was a very interesting read and a very interesting reveals all throughout. Um, with the comparisons and um, contemplations of the different histories and uh, fables which make up the modern day mythologies and uh, religions all right have a nice night thanks for joining me